there are things in life that uh, want to sink our faith. Um, Garrett Kell put it like this. He said, in the parable of the soils, observe that the good soil may still have resisting rocks, persecuting thorns, and choking weeds. The heart's good soil must be filled, must be tilled. The garden must be weeded, and the thorns must be cut back. Believers must cultivate good soil to bear fruit. Um, if you're a non-Christian here today, uh, you may think that the passage is we're about to read out of the Bible are too harsh and unloving. But I hope you will see that they are actually loving and true and for our good this morning. Sometimes we have to go through hard passages. And when you preach through a book of the Bible, uh, you don't get to skip them. And so today we're going to do some heart work. And heart work is hard work. It's hard to work on our hearts. So I have a big idea for you today. If you don't have a teaching sheet there on those back tables, you should grab one. Uh, it'll be very helpful to you today. There's lots of blanks, and if you're a doodler, it will also help you. And so um, here's the big idea of Luke 17, 1 through 19. Cultivating our hearts is hard, time-consuming, and sometimes painful. But Jesus is worth all our grace-driven effort and honest conversations. Cultivating our hearts is hard, time-consuming and sometimes painful, but Jesus is worth all our grace-driven effort and honest conversations. One more time. Cultivating our hearts is hard, it's time-consuming, it's sometimes painful, but Jesus is worth all of our grace-driven effort and honest conversations. So cultivating our hearts requires our grace-driven effort the church's watchful and nurturing eye that we want to care for each other. The church should be a safe place for us to have heart conversations, to deal with temptations and sin. We want to cultivate the good soil of our hearts in order to bear fruit for God's glory, right? That's what we want to do as Christians. So today I'm going to go through some things, and they're kind of the, the marks of a healthy, maturing Christian if you have a Bible, and I hope you do, I'd love you to turn to Luke chapter 17, Luke 17. We have finally made our way to chapter 17. Uh, when you get there, if you'd say word, um, that'll let us all know that you found the right book and the right chapter. Um, why do we do that? Because we believe this is the word of God. And so today, uh, if you're having trouble finding that, Matthew, Mark, Luke, first, few, first three chapters of your New Testament, the second half of your Bible. If you get to Psalms, take a right. And uh, you'll eventually come to Matthew, Mark, and Luke, okay? Luke 17, 1 through 4. And he said to his disciples, Jesus is talking to his disciples, Temptations to sin are sure to come, but woe to the one through whom they come. It would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were cast into the sea than, it, than that he should cause one of these little ones to sin. Pay attention to yourselves. If your brother sins, rebuke him. If, and if he repents, forgive him. And if he sins against you seven times in the day and turns to you seven times saying, I repent, you must forgive him. Verse 1. Every person will face temptation to sin. Uh, you probably already know this, but a temptation is a, is a pull, an influence, an enticement to do something that is wrong, Right? Being, being or feeling tempted is not itself sin. But let me kind of summarize this. Verses 1 and 2. We battle temptation and the desire to tempt others. We battle temptation and the desire to tempt others. So if you're here today, uh, all of us with breath in our lungs today, we battle temptation and the desire to tempt others. So how does a, a healthy, mature Christian fight temptation? Your number one weapon, our number one weapon, is the Word of God. It is the Bible. It's what we need to, to have. We need to equip ourselves with it. Listen to what 2 Timothy 3, 16 through 17 says. All Scripture is breathed out by God. That's why we say it's the Word of God. And it's profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. That the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. 
That we want to be equipped for every good work. And the only way for us to do that is to open our Bibles and let it soak into our hearts. And so this fighting of sin is a spiritual battle. And warfare requires a battle plan. We have a, 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 we have a lot of military people, right? Former military, present military. If we're going to go into warfare, we need a battle plan. And so uh, today I'm going to try to give you one. Okay, it's going to seem kind of heavy at times, and so just take breaths in between. I'm not going to tell you when to breathe, okay? Um, we have some booklets in our lobby. They're little colored booklets, booklets um, and they look like this. If you're like, man, I haven't read a book in a long time, maybe this is for you, okay? And they're free. How much is that? Free, all right? And so uh, let me just read a couple of the titles for you. Uh, what should I do now that I'm a Christian? Some of you uh, may have just... Maybe you became a Christian a long time ago and you're just like, hey, I still don't really understand what I'm supposed to be doing. I'd love somebody who could disciple me. There's a book out there that says, how can I find someone to disciple me? Another one says, what if I don't feel like going to church? Um, some of us today, right? Uh, I'll tell you a couple of Sundays ago, daylight savings time, don't feel like it, okay? Uh, I wanted to start like two in the afternoon. That would be a good time. Um, how can I find someone to disciple me? Why should I be baptized? Uh, there's a new one coming out that's not off uh, the press uh, yet. Well, it's off the press, but it's not in our church yet. But it's called, um, How Do I Fight Sin and Temptation? It's by a, a guy that I know. His name is Garrett Kell. And so today I'm going to give you some things from a booklet we don't have yet, but we're going to make it available for you. And you can grab it out there because we all struggle with how to fight sin and temptation. Um, we, he, he's going to offer us some very helpful ways. And, uh, and so let me give them to you in kind of a, a, a one, two, three, four order. Okay? Y'all good? Number one, don't fight sin by ignoring it. We don't fight sin by ignoring it. An unwillingness to admit sin prevents you from repenting of it. If you just choose to ignore it like it's a ghost or like it's not going to hurt you, uh, pretending sin isn't there won't help you fight it. <laughs> Listen to how he gives an example of this about ignoring sin. Ben was a jokester and at times his jesting became inappropriate. He turned innocent comments into crude remarks and occasionally used off-color language to get a laugh. When conviction came, he rationalized it away. He'd think, I didn't really mean it. It's not who I really am. It's not that big of a deal. I'm free in Christ. We don't fight sin by ignoring it. We don't fight sin by pretending that we're not a part of it. Number two. Don't fight sin by entertaining it. We don't fight sin by entertaining it. We, we also can't fight by entertaining sin. Uh, listen to Jess. Jess struggled with body image. She envied girls who seemed to lose weight effortlessly and look beautiful in whatever they wore. Her insecurity tempted her to envy others, hate herself, and have an unhealthy relationship with food. She noticed that spending time on certain social media apps made things worse. Yet rather than deleting those apps, she allowed herself to linger, fantasizing about the life she'd have if she were thinner. She wanted to test her resolve and prove that she was strong enough to live a normal life. The problem, however, is that entertaining temptation enables sin. Our flesh grows stronger and our resolve weaker with every lingering dose. You can't manage sin. You must kill it. What did Jess need to do? She needed to delete those apps. She needed to unfollow those people. She needed to take a, a hard resolve to not sin and so to, to not linger in those things. You can't manage sin. You must kill it. If I, if I need to put it this way, and, I, and I've said this to you guys before, we need to take it into the light and beat it with a Louisville slugger. Because it wants to kill you. You can't make it your friend. You can't entertain it. Number three, we don't fight sin by indulging it. We don't fight sin by indulging it. You see, sin wants us to think that if we will indulge in it, it will be satisfied and go away. The fact is, 
Feeding our sin only strengthens it. It's like a, a hungry monster. There's so many examples of this in the Bible. Do not be deceived. Giving sin what it wants only empowers it to want more. We do not fight sin by indulging it. And number four, we do not fight sin by exchanging it. We do not fight sin by exchanging it. A shallow fight with sin will settle for substituting one sin for another. Listen to Henry's example. Henry's impulsive spending was destroying his life. So he took great measures to halt his poor stewardship. He set a budget. He got accountability. He even froze his credit cards. The problem, however, is that he began to indulge in excessive eating. Like an uncured disease with a new symptom, his impulsive lack of self-control merely manifested itself in another area. Don't just exchange one sin for another. We need to aim to eliminate it and replace it with a greater affection for Christ. See, temptation gives birth to sin when we give into it. Listen to how James 1, 13 through 15 says it. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. So Satan desires for, for sin to kill, steal, and destroy. So uh, on my sheet of paper, uh, I didn't put this on your notes, but I just put little uh, uh, arrows that I said, temptation leads to sin, which leads to death. You and I can't treat sin with any respect. Sin is out to kill you, brother and sister. Look at verse 2. Jesus warns against being a tempter. The one facing temptation may escape sin, but the one tempting others will not escape judgment. Um, Jesus gives a, a very harsh illustration, and you probably wouldn't have written this down, but he said it. An ancient millstone, it weighed a lot. Usually women would work with these millstones, but it took several men to move it from uh, one place to another. These, these large stones were carved in circles with a, with a hollow center, like a big stone donut, okay? And so Jesus describes what it would be like if one end of that rope was, uh, was tied around the millstone and the other end was tied around someone's neck and it was cast overboard. You and I have a tendency like sin will not control us. This is Jesus' example, not mine. I want you to read it. I want you to hide it in your hearts. That Jesus is saying that it would be better for a person to be drowned, basically, if, instead of tempting. And so we, we want to put this in terms of grace, of course, but we also want to put this in the danger of sin, Jesus says this would be better than causing another person to sin. You see, Jesus knows that sin is deadly. And this coming Friday, we're going to celebrate how he knows that to be sure and true. And this coming Sunday, we're going to celebrate that he knows that he has power over sin and death. But verse 3 tells us to pay attention to ourselves uh, to check yourself, I would say it like that. Check yourself before you wreck yourself, right? Examine yourself. As a church, we want to exercise a, a watchful and nurturing care over each other. We want to pay close attention to rebuking and forgiving. And so let me give one dis description of the church. It's not all-encompassing, but it's a pretty good one. A church is a collection of people receiving and giving correction, grace, and encouragement as we avoid temptation while abiding in Christ. This isn't all the church is, but it's part of being the body of Christ. It's part of being the church. It's part of being the family of God that you and I want to have uh, uh, the ability to speak life into each other. We want to come close to each other. We want to be known. 
See that rebuking is loving and caring. So how do we rebuke and correct sin in a Christ-like way? Well, Matthew 18 is going to tell us a step-by-step process. And this is Christian to Christian. This is what's happening in Matthew 18, verses 15 through 17. If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother But if he does not listen, take one or two others along with you that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. In the church, we call this church discipline. Let me just make something Uh, Very, very clear about church discipline. The goal is restoration and repentance, not judgment. Everybody with me? Sometimes even on Sundays like this, we can read this and go, oh, that's so harsh. No, it would be harsh if we let that person keep going towards the ditch. (laughs) Y'all ever seen somebody throw their life in the ditch? I have. It's more loving to stop them before they get there, right? So Jesus is going to give us a step-by-step process of church discipline. So let me just kind of spell it out like this. Verse uh, number one is you go. You go to the person who has sinned against you. Why do you go? Because you love Jesus. (laughs) Because you love Jesus. Because that's your brother. That's your sister. If the person listens and, and returns and repents... You have gained a brother. You have gained a sister. And if they don't, you take one or two others. Why? Because you obviously can't get it done by yourself. So you take one or two other people and call them back to repent. And then it says, if they will not listen, you take it to the church. And step four would would be to practice church discipline and remove the person from church membership. And let me just point this out, that Matthew 18 is not done like that. Everybody with me? This is with a lot of prayer and a lot of care and a lot of hard conversations. But you and I are are called to bring the sheep back. So what does the Bible call us to rebuke and correct? Here's just a few of them and... I'm going to need you to do some homework and look at these texts because it's just too many to, to read out loud this morning. What does the Bible call us to rebuke and correct? Well, the first is unrepentant sin. If you see somebody in unrepentant sin, then Matthew 18 is your model of, of how to go to them and bring them back. Call them to repentance in a loving and truthful and kind way. We want to rebuke a, a lack of, of discipline. 2 Thessalonians 3 is is our model. We don't want people to be lazy. We don't want them to be idle. Uh, Paul in 2 Thessalonians says that you want to call them back. You want to tell them you got to work for food. (laughs) That you you don't want to be idle in your relationship with Jesus, in in the way you live life, a lack of discipline, divisiveness. Titus 3 would tell us that you don't want to stir up division, that if someone is stirring up division, that you could go to them and call them back to repentance. The last one I listed here is public and scandalous sin. 1 Corinthians 5 gives us an example of that in the life of the church and you want to call them back. You don't want to put it on the church sign outside. You want to go to them. Mano y mano. There's some Spanish for you. That's all I got today. And so, but you want to, you want a, a public uh, you, want, you don't want this public thing to get out of hand. You want to be able to go to them and call them to repentance. And, and, if, and if he repents, forgive him. Verse 3 says, if she repents, forgive her. <laughs> that's, that's easier written than done, right? <laughs> so number 3, uh, uh, verse 3, I'd just like to make a point that regret and remorse are not the same as repentance. 
Regret and remorse are not the same as repentance. As we've said, I, th- I feel like I've been saying this for the past four or five weeks, that repent means to turn from your sin and embrace Jesus. It's not just giving sin the Heisman. It is an embracing of Jesus and his way. We're not looking in the church for behavioral modification. <laughs> We're looking for people that look like Jesus, that want to look like Jesus, so repentance involves a turning from sin and a, a turning to and embracing Jesus. 2 Corinthians 7.10 puts it like this. For godly grief produces a repentance that leads to salvation without regret, whereas worldly grief produces death. You see, worldly grief is, is just regret and remorse because someone got busted. But godly grief leads to true repentance, which leads to salvation without regret. One temptation we can all face is to be all rebuking and no forgiving. (laughs) Only truth and no love. And some of you grew up in a church like that. Maybe some of you had parents that were like that. They They were always rebuking and never forgiving. Or maybe they were always rebuking and when they sinned against you, they never said, I'm sorry. I've talked with man after man that said, my dad never said he was sorry. He never asked me to forgive him. So one temptation we all face is to be all rebuking and no forgiving, but the other temptation is to be all forgiving and never rebuking. But we fail our brothers and sisters in Christ when we don't offer them a correcting word. Listen to how John Stott put it. He put it better than I could have ever put it. But truth without love is too hard and love without truth is too soft. (laughs) Truth without love is too hard and love without truth is too soft. Let me just pause for a second here as, as we reflect on this being Palm Sunday and We have to give some thought to that. How could they go from saying, Hosanna, King of Israel, to crucify him? Well, I'm going to make a a big suggestion today that one of the ways that they could have not gone from Hosanna, King of Israel, to crucify him is by someone having some hard conversations with them. Of going, do you really believe that he's the King of Israel? Would you bet your life on it? Sometimes in this season of the, the church calendar, our, our attendance can go up. And if you're here today and you haven't been in church in a while, I'm so glad you're here. But let me make sure you understand that, that coming inside of here doesn't make you a Christian any more than standing in your carport and rooming like a car makes you a car. The only way for you and I to cross from death to life is to confess Jesus as Lord and repent. To say, Jesus, I believe you are the Savior and King and I'm a sinner and so I need you to save me. Truth without love is too hard and love without truth is too soft. Look at verse 4. And if he sins against you seven times in the day and turns to you seven times saying, I repent, you must forgive him. Uh, Hey, uh, husbands and wives, keep your elbows to yourself, okay? We have a tendency when we read texts like this to go, I wish they were here. I hope you're hearing this. Jesus is speaking to all of us, right? Right? Every act of repentance requires an, an act of forgiveness. So verse 4, verse four would restoration is the ability to forgive, which allows people to move past their, their failures, right? You don't want people to, to stay in that sense of failure and regret and remorse. You want them to move to a, a life of repentance and faith. You want to move to joy in their salvation. So that restoration is that ability to forgive, which allows people to move past their failures. And I will say this as a piece of of relationship counseling. Don't get historical. 
If your spouse is in here or not in here, the worst thing you can do for your marriage is to keep bringing up their failures over and over. Remember that time in 2010? Stop it. If you need to have one more conversation about it, have it and then have the funeral. I tell this to couples in premarital counseling. Stop. Don't get historical. It's going to mess you up. If you need to have hard conversations, have them, but, but offer forgiveness. You see, the disciples are, are not to pursue their spirituality in isolation from one another. He's, for Jesus, faith is not merely a private affair. It's a, a community that pursues this together. And in a community that pursues this together, we want to have honest and loving, confronting, confronting, that's my worst Alabama accent ever. <laughs> honest, loving, and confronting behavior occurs without destroying the relationships. Jesus is going to model for this in the Lord's Prayer. He's going to talk about forgiveness and restoring people from sin, which is sometimes, uh, when, even when sometimes people sin against us. Listen to what he says in the Lord's Prayer. Matthew 6, 13 through 15. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. You see, the, the mark of a, a maturing and healthy Christian is, is to be forgiving. And Jesus reminds us of this. Uh, I learned the Lord's Prayer by playing baseball. My baseball coach, I don't think he taught me anything else about Jesus, but, but he made us say the Lord's Prayer. And so it's kind of hammered into my heart. But when I look at this, I'm like, I must be a forgiving person. Forgiveness flows from a healthy heart. So the goal of all of this is restoration. It's reconciliation. It's right relationship. One of the things you and I should look at when we look at the cross is that vertical relationship needs to be in line, which will produce a horizontal relationship, which will be in line. Jesus is concerned about both. And so that's, that's one of the purposes of the church, that we can come together and stir each other's affections for Jesus. Look at Luke 17, 5 through 6. Jesus is going to seem to kind of take a, a curve, but I'm going to try to see if we can follow his, his line of teaching. So after hearing all of that hard teaching in verses 1 through 4, the apostles said to the Lord, increase our faith. And the Lord said, if you had faith like a grain of mustard seed, you could say to this mulberry tree, be uprooted and planted in the sea, and it would obey you. So is, is this the disciples' response to Jesus' teaching? It, it seems to be the case, right? Lord, I don't know if I can forgive like that. Lord, I don't know if I can have those kind of awkward, honest conversations. <laughs> Increase my faith. And Jesus says to them, put all your mustard-sized faith in me. How many of you came into this room today with some mustard-sized faith? Maybe you've been beating yourself up about that. I just don't have a lot of faith. Jesus is saying that just with a little bit of faith in a very big God, that he can do some things that would blow your mind. Some of you have already had these type of conversations with people and you have not seen them repent. And it grieves your heart. The disciples are saying right here, Jesus, I don't know if we can do it. Increase our faith. Help us. Jesus says, if you said to that, that mulberry tree, be uprooted and planted in the sea, it would obey you. I think Jesus is speaking in hyperbole here, but, but he also could be telling the truth. <laughs> That your faith in a big God can do big things and unforgiveness is a temptation to stumble into sin. 
Some of us have been hanging on to stuff that people did way in the past. And what I'm saying to you today is maybe you just need to get alone with Jesus and say, increase my faith. I so want to forgive them. Listen to how Daryl Bach puts it. Jesus says that the way to increase faith is simply to have it and watch it produce significant results. 7 through 10. Will any one of you who is a servant plowing or keeping sheep say to him when he has come in from the field, come at once and recline at table? Will he not rather say to him, prepare supper for me and dress properly and serve, serve me while I eat and drink and afterward you will eat and drink? Does he thank the servant? Does he thank the servant because he did what was commanded? So you also, when you have done all that you were commanded, say, we, were un, we are unworthy servants. We have only done what was our duty. So the scene is going to start at the end of daytime chores. The, the servant is coming in. And can you imagine a servant coming in and kicking up his feet next to the table and going, Master, I've done your work. Now serve me. <laughs> Some of you are like, I have some employees like that, right? <laughs> but a servant does not take a seat beside his master and eat with him right out of the field. The, the master does not thank the servant for doing what he was told to do. The same is true when Jesus commands us to forgive. Forgiveness is our duty as servants. Forgiving others is not a reason to boast. Verses 7 through 10, sometimes we are tempted with pride because we forgave an offense. Just as a reminder, pride is the enemy of humility. Sometimes we are tempted with pride because we forgave an offense and pride is the enemy of humility. And what Jesus is saying is he is saying, I have told you, to forgive people who, offend, who, who offended you. And this Friday, we will celebrate the fact that he very well understood what it cost. Forgive them, Father, for they know not what they do. Right? This is a something I share with our Membership Matters class, and so I, I hope it'll be encouraging to you. I'm going to try to explain it, so just give me a second. The church needs more providers and less consumers. There are too many Christians sitting at the table saying, serve me, what about me, what can be done for me? And so let me clarify with, yes, there are times when we need help. Everyone understands that. And during those times, we need to ask for help, which involves us pushing down our pride and saying, we need help. And we need more Christians saying, how can I help? When you walk into Walmart, Kind of wearing those shirts, right? <laughs> sometimes helpful, sometimes not, right? <laughs> but we, we want to, as Christians, say to each other, how can I help? Because Jesus doesn't owe us anything. To put it just really honestly, you and I need to obey his word. I was in a meeting with pastors from this area the other day, and uh, the particular church we were at was uh, right near Sumter High School. Everybody, everybody understand where we are in, in Sumter at this point? Okay? So it's right over there near the railroad tracks. And they had done a demographic study uh, all around their church, and 71% of their community is unchurched. I just tell you where that is because it's no different from here. In your neighborhoods and my neighborhoods today, your car was one of the only ones pulling out of the parking lot headed towards church. 
Don't be fooled by all the crosses in the yards. Sumter is largely unchurched. And some people call us the Bible Belt. I want to say this to the Christians in the room, so I want you to listen very closely. What we really need to do is is take our Bible Belt and cinch it and gird up our loins and go and share the gospel with people. Your neighbors do not know Jesus. And their lives are a wreck. The people you work with, they don't know Jesus. They don't want to go to church. They don't want anything to do with church. You have got to enter in and share the gospel with them. You might assume that they know the gospel, but they most likely do not know anyone who actually believes in Jesus and lives it out. When I start talking about missions overseas, I think some people in here go, well, that's over there. No, brothers and sisters, that's right here. They don't know anyone when asked about the weekend who starts with Sunday. (laughs) You ever notice that when you ask them, how was your weekend? And somebody starts on Friday and Saturday and they never make it to Sunday, right? Right? Why? Because people's attention spans are very short and they really don't care, okay? (laughs) What if you reverse that situation? They said, how was your weekend? Well, at church yesterday, (laughs) we were talking about this very uncomfortable subject, which I probably shouldn't tell you about, but I'm going to tell you about, right? (laughs) We were talking about loving and caring for each other well and how when we need help, we can ask for help, but also that we could be a help to other people and we could point them to Jesus, Because he's the thing that matters the most to me. We are not to expect an attaboy or girl from Jesus for doing what he has commanded us to do. If I had to say it even more honestly, I would say get over yourself. And come alongside somebody else. Be in community, in close community, where you can have those kind of awkward, honest conversations. Look at Luke 17, 11 through 19. You're going to be able to breathe a little bit in this passage, but don't ignore the nine. On the way to Jerusalem, he was passing along between Samaria and Galilee. And as he entered a village, he was met by ten lepers who stood at a distance and lifted up their voices saying, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. When he saw them, he said to them, go and show yourselves to the priest. And as they went, they were cleansed. Then one of them, how many? When he saw that he was healed, turned back, praising God with a loud voice. And he fell on his face at Jesus' feet, giving him thanks. Now he was a Samaritan. Then Jesus answered, "Were were not ten cleansed? Where are the nine? Was no one found to return and give praise to God except this foreigner? And he said to him, rise and go your way. Your faith has made you well. So ten lepers stood at a distance. They called out to Jesus, have mercy on us, Jesus, master. And Jesus doesn't even have to get near them. He just says, go Uh, and go to your priest, and on their way, they were cleansed. (laughs) How powerful is that? Have you ever gone to the doctor's office and the doctor doesn't touch you at all? Isn't it unnerving? I've gone to some pediatricians with my boys, and the doctor doesn't even touch them when we're telling them something's wrong with with one of them, and and I'm like, I don't trust you. (laughs) But Jesus... From a distance, says, go to your priest. And on their way, he heals them. Not the priest. (laughs) Jesus. Only one of them turned back to thank him. The, The one who came back was a Samaritan. Jesus drops that in there just to mess us up, right? 
This, this foreigner, this person that's not even supposed to know about me, he's the one that returned. Where are the other nine? So verse 19, I would just like to point out that gratitude flows from a healthy heart. Gratitude flows from a healthy heart. All right, today, uh, as you've noticed, we're going to celebrate the Lord's Supper. So I'm going to move through this application rather rapidly, okay? Get your pens sharp. Wet them up. I don't know. Tap them on your tongue. I don't know if that's even like a thing. But uh, <clears throat> cultivating our hearts is hard. It's time-consuming, sometimes painful. But Jesus is worth all of our grace-driven effort and honest conversation. So we want to, number one, read the Bible on a regular basis. We want to read the Bible on a regular basis. This could be a point of application every single week. Um, I'll tell you, one of my favorite things I've done as your pastor is uh, what we've been doing on Wednesday nights. Uh, we, uh, uh, along with a group of men, we've been reading the book, Thoughts for Young Men, out loud. Uh, we are on the very last conclusion this week. The book's about 95 pages, uh, and we would read a section, discuss a section, read a section, discuss a section. And it's been so good. J.C. Ryle wrote this book in the 1800s and listen to what he has to say today. This is the only way to be competent in the scriptures. A hasty glance at the Bible now and then does little good. At that rate, you will never become familiar with its treasures or feel the sword of the Spirit fitted to your hand in the hour of conflict. I, I, I mistyped this. But if I were to write this book, I would say, get your mind stoked with Scripture. <laughs> By diligent reading, and you will soon discover its value and power. Text will rise up in your hearts in the moment of temptation. Commands will suggest themselves in seasons of doubt. Promises will permeate your thoughts in the time of discouragement. How about it for an 1800s Puritan speaking to where we are today? And as I've listened to these men gather around this table on a weekly basis and read these hard truths out loud and then discuss them, I will just say that they stirred my affections for Jesus over and over again. Number two, rebuke and correct humbly because the goal is growth. We want them to grow in their relationship with the Lord. Rebuke and correct humbly because the goal is growth. One of, one of the best ways to grow in humility is to spend time thanking God for the many ways he has graciously corrected you. Aren't you so glad that the Holy Spirit does a lot of the correcting? I am. Number three, our rebukes should be clear and thoughtful. Our rebukes should be clear and thoughtful. They don't need to walk away from the conversation going, I wonder what he was trying to say. Remember John Stott's words of wisdom, truth without love is too hard and love without truth is too soft. May we be clear and thoughtful when we are rebuking and correcting. Number four, spring load grace. Spring load grace. If you weren't here a few weeks ago, I talked about my desire to, to get honey buns out of uh, those little machines and, uh, and how that spring load, it, it, it's just there and it, it shoots that goodness from God out of that and it drops down, right? You and I want to spring load grace. The church would be better known. We want to have grace in the hopper ready to go. Number five, ask Jesus to increase your faith. Ask Jesus to increase your faith. When is the last time you asked God to increase your faith? You just went to him and you said, God, I need you to increase my faith. If you're a non-Christian in here today, you could pray that prayer this afternoon. You could pray it right now. God, I don't, I don't even know if I have a mustard seed worth of faith. But you're the one who gives the faith. I didn't bring it to the party. Increase my faith. Number six, pray God-sized prayers. 
Pray God-sized prayers. Pray some prayers that only God could answer. That you and your, your man-made effort, you can't even, you can't even uh, make it happen. Number seven, cultivate an attitude of gratitude. Cultivate an attitude of gratitude. That gratitude is, is the attitude of the humble. That we want to be grateful for all that God has done and all the times he's had to correct us. When I was looking at um, the verses that were coming up, you know, it'd kind of be our natural thing. A lot of pastors right now are doing a, an Easter series and they'll just take a couple of breaks from what they're preaching. And when I looked at this, uh, these verses, I just thought to myself, God, I, 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 your timing is always your timing. And so I, when I think about how those people went from laying down palm branches to yelling, crucify him, It just reminded me about how on Sunday, sometimes my, my heart is so focused on Jesus, and then by Monday or Tuesday, it's just fading away. It's so easy for us to read verses like that in the Bible and go, I would have never. Oh, friend, you may have not said it out loud, but you've done it in your heart. As we looked at these verses today and I thought about us celebrating the Lord's Supper today, I thought it would be a good time for us to examine ourselves. So I just want to take a couple of minutes as we start and then I'm going to do my best to explain the Lord's Supper so we all can understand what's happening in the room. Um, if you would just bow your heads with me. Father, these may have been some of the most thoughtful, hard, difficult verses that we've read in the book of Luke. All of them have been your word, but when we think about rebuking and correcting, because so many of us, Jesus, are people pleasers, we just, we wince at that. Jesus, when we think about people correcting us, we wince at that. We don't desire that type of community. We don't want to let somebody know that we don't have all of our stuff together. So in moments like these, in the quietness of the room, Holy Spirit, we just ask that you would shine your light on our hearts. And in the quietness of our hearts, may we confess our sin to you, Jesus, and ask for forgiveness.